It's a long way from Perth, Australia to Wyoming, but Christopher Dragon made that journey enthusiastically and musically. He's the conductor of the Wyoming Symphony Orchestra, one of several regional symphonies in the state that Chris Dragon thinks provides an important, even essential link to the higher arts in the nation's least populated state. A conversation with Chris Dragon. I'm Steve Peck of Wyoming PBS. This is Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. As the conductor and music director of the Wyoming Symphony, Christopher Dragon puts everything he has into the job of getting the best music possible from his small orchestra based in Casper. <laughs> Dragon, whose full-time job is with the Colorado Symphony in Denver, where he's the resident conductor, added the Wyoming Symphony post to his resume a few years ago. In Casper, the dynamic 32-year-old is in charge of all things musical. What's the difference between the conductor and the musical director, or, or is there one? There can be a lot of conductors, for example, guest conductors, you go and travel and visit an orchestra for a week and then you leave. Whereas with a music director, you have, I guess, a little bit more of a commitment to that one orchestra. You see the orchestra more regularly throughout the season, and it's really your job to put the season together and to program the music. So basically, the direction of where an orchestra goes, a big part of that is due to the music director. From listening to you, uh -huh. I get the impression you're not a Wyoming native. No. Uh, <laughs> where were you, where do you come from? Where did you grow up? So I'm originally from Perth, Western Australia. So it is one of the most, it's one of the most isolated, populated cities in the world. So far from everything. <laughs> what uh, were your origins in music? Did you play an instrument as a kid? I studied piano at a very young age, um, but then I switched to clarinet in primary school and I ended up doing my studies on it. So I did my Bachelor of Music in clarinet performance. Clarinet. So that's, that's was my whole, that was my whole music training was clarinet. How commonplace is it? for a conductor to have emerged uh, on the clarinet, is that? Oh, well, I think to, today, like in the contemporary setting of conductors, the path to becoming a conductor is very different to what it was before. Back in the day, you had to be a repetitor, someone that would play piano for either the opera or ballet rehearsals, and that's how you would learn the repertoire. And then from there, you would eventually graduate and become a conductor. That was the traditional path. But today, you can go to a university to study conducting, which I didn't really do. But uh, yeah, my path is not traditional whatsoever. The way that I kind of got into it all was back home in Perth, they didn't offer conducting as a subject. Um, and it was always something I was interested in. I would go to concerts, this was in university, I would go and watch symphony concerts, Brian, and I would just be transfixed on the conductor the whole time. Even playing clarinet in orchestra, you sit at the very back of the orchestra, and you would hear things that, I would hear things that maybe went right, but it's not really my place to say, is the clarinet is sitting at the back of the orchestra. I can't suddenly go up to the violins and be like, oh, I think this should be like this or this. Like that's totally stepping out of line. So there was always something that interested me about being on that, being on the podium and having that ability to affect the music in a greater way. Um, yeah, so basically the way that I got here, I guess, is that I started my own orchestra when I was still a student. I was in my early 20s, and I just got a whole bunch of friends together from both of the music universities and put on a concert, which, looking back on that now, was one of the most craziest things. Mm -hmm. Having never conducted before and deciding to put on a concert um, in front of people, like a public concert, um, and luckily it didn't go, it, it went okay, and I think that gave me enough encouragement to pursue it further. So from there, 
I basically conducted everything I possibly could. Every sort of amateur group from concert band to brass band to youth orchestra, I did everything I possibly could. And it just gave me the experience to, to learn my craft and to hone it. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, that's all that stuff. That conducting craft was on full display as Dragon led the orchestra through a final rehearsal one day before its spring concert. And his love for the clarinet was evident as well in conducting George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, home of the most famous clarinet solo in all orchestral music. How do you go about deciding what the Wyoming Symphony is going to play in a particular concert? Yeah, so programming a season, it, it's a little bit of a balancing act because you have a whole variety of concerts within a season, maybe five or six, at least with the Wyoming Symphony, we have about six concerts. And you want to make sure you cover a wide variety of rep repertoire and repertoire that will not only connect with our musicians, but our audience. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to serve the people in this community. So as a conductor, you don't just get to pick the pieces you want to conduct. You have to also think about who you're performing this music to. So every time I try to program a piece, I try to think what is gonna be appealing to a wide audience and also what's going to build the orchestra because even through programming, you can improve the quality of an orchestra by focusing on certain things. So there actually is a lot that comes down to programming. It's not just putting down whatever you want to do. It, there really is a big picture and a kind of like a puzzle um, when trying to put a season together. Good, awesome, good. Cool, all this is fine. Good, 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 good. So let's put that all together. Let's go from the middle section from 20, what is that? 28, 28. Just in the, the violins, I thought we marked this yesterday, all these long notes were still way too thick in the texture, the third of 28, any time we get to long notes, I thought we'd start at pian pianissimo, right? And only go up to piano. Yeah, we're, we're way too thick, so the horn should be easily on top of the texture. At the moment, it's way too heavy for all of that. Also, when the piano comes in with the trumpet, this is the third of 30, same thing. It should come down to a pianissimo in all the long notes especially in the strings and winds, down to a piano pianissimo so the trumpet and piano can hear each other. At the moment, it's way too thick and it's hard to hear, yeah? Can we go, please, 20, 28, 28? And... <laughs> Yes, of course, the conductor is a part of the performance. It can't really happen without them. But to me, it's all about serving the music. I don't see myself as the fixture of what people come to see. They come to hear great music, and I'm just helping in that, in that journey, basically. When you're conducting, um, not only are you trying to get what you want, what you think you need what, from the orchestra, but you're being moved by it as you hear it, and mm. that's part of what we get to see. Oh, absolutely, and a lot of audience members say this, they say I'm a very entertaining conductor to watch, even though I have no idea what I do when I'm up there. I honestly, nothing is choreographed, nothing is planned. I, I agree, I think 
to give a convincing performance, you have to be, you have to embody the music. You have to be so committed to it that nothing else is in your mind but that music that's happening at that moment. So it's, yeah, it's quite funny that, yeah, a lot of audience members say, oh, it's so much fun watching you conduct and that, that sort of thing. Like, I can see the music and what you're doing. Um, but to me, I, all I'm doing with my gestures is trying to, to evoke the sound that I'm thinking in my head. Um, it's not, again, like I said, nothing at all is planned. You nothing is planned. You don't take the podium thinking, tonight I'm going to give a good performance. Oh. That's not what it is. Oh my gosh, no, 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 like that is the furthest from it. Like I, the whole, like even just coming up and bowing, people have noticed this also. It's really not about me as much as I jump around and do my thing. It, to me, it's always about the music and, and helping the musicians and, and helping all of us through a performance to do the very best that we possibly can. Awesome, good, 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 awesome, great, great, great. One, one request in the, in the strings, <clears throat> whenever we head to those long notes when the trumpet and the piano is playing, can we always diminuendo into that, yeah? So it's not subito piano when the long notes start, but let's always come away any time on those last two quarter notes. So two after 30, those last two quarter notes, quick diminuendo. Same thing whenever the grandioso comes back, always those two last quarter notes, quick diminuendo, so it clears the texture for them in that, in that section. Gorgeous, good, that middle section is good. Okay, uh, let's work backwards. People use the term classical music, and I know in sort of academic musical terms, it means something a little bit different from what it means to the average concert goer. But let's just, I'm, I'm using the broadest possible term. Which I think is okay. And yeah. I think people, yeah. people tend to view it as sort of old fashioned, old school, solemn, staid, somber, unchanging kind of music. But if you look into the history of some of these uh, works, they were greeted in their day. It wasn't uncommon for them to be greeted with uh, a furor almost, uh, riots in the streets practically, demonstrations against this being performed in public, almost the way that you'd hear when, I don't know, when, when Elvis Presley went on the Ed Sullivan show and they showed him from the waist up uh -huh. because it was just so outrageous. And that happened with Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. With that's, that's orchestral the piece. music yeah. sometimes yeah. too, mm -hmm. didn't it? So it had cultural impact in its in its day and still does. I'm sure you would agree. Oh, absolutely. And going back to like yeah, people the the conception of classical music being I guess stuffy yeah. um, for a certain kind of audience. I think that is very much changing today. Orchestral music is part of everyone's life. It, it plays a major part in movies, film, uh, video games, TV shows, advertisements. It is everywhere. If people recognize it or not, you're constantly listening to orchestral music. And you see quite a lot of the, the big orchestras around the States, they have now started performing films with the orchestra playing the music live mm -hmm. to the film. So I've done many of those, Star Wars, Jurassic Park, all those sort of big John Williams things um, where we play the music live. So it's... You, Audiences today, they, they do experience orchestral music regularly in their lives. Even if they don't immediately think of it in that way. You exactly. mentioned video games. Mm -hmm. The video game is an incredible world of creativity in, from many different angles. And many of the big important games have an orchestral score and an orchestra performing it for the, for the game. Well, for even, the conductor. Yeah, even that today. We, we, we've put on concerts where we focus primarily just on video game music. It has become its own genre. And for me growing up, I never went to symphony concerts as a kid. Most of my um, exposure to this sort of music was through film and video games. So that's totally how I grew up. <laughs>
Because as a conductor, unlike an instrumentalist, you can't just pick up your instrument in the corner of your room and practice it whenever you want. This is one of my questions. Yeah. Can I, how does a conductor rehearse? Well, it's get ready. Yeah, it all the very first step is starting from the score, which is which is our I guess giant book, which has every single instrument lined out and has every single part. So it's it's your job to figure out how that all fits together bit by bit, and it's it's a very very long process. Like for me to, for example, learn a upcoming subscription concert, I would start learning it at least a month in advance, if not a little bit earlier. And when you say learning it, you're mm -hmm. doing it primarily from the score. Mm -hmm. Do you listen? Would you ever listen or watch in an earlier recording that someone else had conducted to get a sense of it? Or no? every, every conductor is different. The first step that I do is I mark it up without listening to anything. So I get my own thoughts and opinions of how the piece should sound and my own ideas. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I do is I write questions. I, I, I write a lot of questions of what is this, what should I do there, and then I hope that over time those answers will come to me. But I think, to me, listening back to recordings and watching videos, I think that's a very valuable resource, especially today, the fact that we have the internet and we have videos from years ago of these great conductors doing it. Why wouldn't you look back mm -hmm. at these resources and see how they, they, did cert they conducted certain transitions and things like that? To me, it's all very valuable. At the end of the day, you can't really copy a recording. Like That's never going to work. You always have to do your own interpretation. But I think looking back to those sort of recordings and videos, it, it can help to answer certain questions you might have. Okay, good, good, good. So just, just be careful before 24. One, two, three, four before 24. Just be careful. That bar will probably be stretched slightly, yeah? The downbeat will come later than, than we expect, yeah? Four before 24. One, two, four before 24. That downbeat will come a little bit later than we expect. Good, 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 good. All right, let's, let's try that one more time, the same spot. As a conductor, looking at the score for the first time, how often is it something that you've never even heard performed before. Is that typical or is it? It, it is actually quite typical really? because there's a lot of contemporary music that I do, collaborations with bands, a lot of film music, um, a lot of contemporary music even that's being discovered and that's being written. Uh, yeah, that's, you don't always, of course there's the, the war horses of Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, those I am familiar with already. So they're, they're a little bit easier because you, you already know the kind of sound world. Um, but when it's a new piece like that, quite often I will have to then go to a piano or something and play part mm -hmm. of it on just to get an idea of where the melody is or what sort of things I should be listening for. Yeah. As a conductor, looking at that score, you have the skill set developed and perhaps innate as well to uh, at least imagine what it's all going to sound like together. I mean, that, you, you get a sense of that in a way that someone who plays just the piccolo probably couldn't do. Well, Absolutely. You better, I guess. Yeah, no, well, yeah, I was going to say, it, it is kind of like our job to hear the overall, the sound world of what the orchestra is producing. So yeah, it is very much in our head, even when you're conducting a performance, which is actually what, when I first started conducting, this was one of the hardest things to, to get comfortable with, is that when you're conducting an orchestra, you have what the piece should sound like in your head, already going in your head, and then you're analyzing that against what the orchestra gives you. So I, I always try not to think about this too much, or else I feel like I'll get into my own head about it and make it harder than it already is. Perth, mm -hmm. long way from Wyoming, mm -hmm. across, it's another day there, across the day. Oh yeah, they're right. in the future right now, yep. I, and, and one of the fun things about this job is asking people what brought them to Wyoming if they weren't here at the start? How did this happen? Wow, well, yeah, so I, I've actually been living in the States now for about seven years. I moved from Australia to the US because I won a job with the Colorado Symphony. So that's been my, my main position and I've, I'm the resident conductor there. I've been there seven years. Um, and when I was there, this was maybe four, four or five years ago, a lot of musicians were letting me know that there was an opportunity in Wyoming for a music director position, and they thought that I would be a really good fit. So I applied, um, and luckily enough, I won the position. So I, I flew over, I conducted the orchestra, I had a week with them, um, and then the orchestra and the committee voted, and they selected me as the music director. So yeah, I've been here, what, four years now, something like that. So yeah, I've loved it. 
Okay, so it's, it pushes forward. This is before 40. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, it's about five bars before 40. After that, that little run, it pushes forward there, yeah? One, two, three, four, five before 40. Put an arrow going forward. It pushes forward. What expectations can you have for an orchestra in Wyoming? We're the least populated state mm -hmm. in the nation, and I don't know that these two things correlate exactly, but I would assume mm. it's, that it might mean there are fewer uh, musicians capable or willing or able or talented enough to perform at the orchestral level. So, so I think the level of what people expect is always going to be high. In terms of what we have here, it's, it's always difficult to say, like it's hard to say, oh yeah, the Wyoming symphony quality is the same as the LA Philharmonic. Um, because the people that work in our orchestra, they also have day jobs, they also have other professions outside of playing their instrument. And it's a smaller group Oh, as it is well, a yes. much smaller group. Um, whereas the people that play in Colorado or the LA Philharmonic, that is their profession. That is what they do. And, we, and because they do so many concerts, they're playing every week and maybe sometimes two or three different programs in one week alone. So the fact that that ensemble is constantly playing together means that the quality is always going to be a little bit better because they're playing as a group constantly. Whereas with any sort of regional orchestra, because you're only meeting for that one week and who knows, maybe the next concert is a month and a half away. So there's always a gap. So it's hard to, to, to build that same quality when the concerts are so spread apart. So there, there are definitely difficulties. Um, but like I said, I, I couldn't be prouder of what we've achieved here. At this rehearsal, the orchestra welcomed guest pianist Diego Catano, who would tackle the rousing piano solos of Rhapsody in Blue. Illustrating the challenges faced by a small regional orchestra, this was the first time the orchestra and the soloist had ever rehearsed together, and the concert was just 24 hours away. Okay, and then you have to watch me for the one-two, yeah? We'll do the blue, 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 blue. One. Uh, even slow, even slow. Give me your tempo. What is your tempo on it? Da da dee da ba ba. It's really slow. Yup ba bee ba 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 bee. Right on it. One two. Mm 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 One two. Okay, we need a consistent tempo. We need a consistent. It started slow and then it got quicker. It, it yeah, it, it started slow and then it got quicker. So, what tempo do you want for this? Ba 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 bi, ya ba 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 bi. Okay, right on it. Good. And this is why we need to have the cut off on beat to each time, so we can so we can be clear, or else it's muddy and we can't hear what's going on. Okay, same spot. Thirty-seven. One. <clears throat> Good, go with him, he's right there. Yeah, something's going on, he's right there. He's right there, go with him. Go with him, he's right there, go with him. One, and. So in a rehearsal especially, you're trying to analyze it and, and work out what you need to fix for it to match that image. Or sometimes your image gets changes, changes to what the orchestra gives you. It's very flexible, it's very, very so, flexible. So if you might hear something better than you had in mind when you hear a good group of musicians mm -hmm. playing it. Yeah, absolutely, and you go with it. Here's an example of that flexibility. The soloist is playing one section of Rhapsody in Blue at a different tempo, or speed, from the tempo Dragon had conducted in earlier rehearsals. He listens, asks the soloist what his preference is, then happily agrees to the change. We didn't ch what tempo do you want for this? So way quicker, okay, much quicker than what I want. Da, 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 bum, bum, beam, bum, okay, da, 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 three, four. <laughs> Okay, so be ready for it to be quite perky, yeah? I, I've not heard it in a quick tempo like that, but just be ready for it to be quick, yeah? And perky. No, it's fine. We got it now. We got it now. I'm not changing. We got it now. We're good. We're good. I just was, it just caught me by surprise. That, 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 that. Three, four. What's the state of the arts, the fine arts, so to speak, in Wyoming, as far as you can tell? After the end of every concert, seeing the audience and just seeing how, and getting to speak with them after, 
seeing how happy and appreciative they are. And like I said, everyone can see the growth. And as a music director, you can't ask for much more. There really is such a thirst and hunger for orchestral music here and for the arts, not just orchestral music. I, I see so much potential in Wyoming, which to me is the most exciting thing about being here. Good. So yeah, the hairpin will happen at the end of this little phrase. Yeah, I'll show where that, that hairpin is. Also, just be careful.